Section 12, Tales 47 to 52 of Eskimo Folk Tales by Knut Rasmussen. Translated by W. W. Worcester. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Section 12, Tale 47 A Tarsuak. A Tarsuak had many enemies, but his many enemies tried in vain to hurt him, and they could not kill him. Then it happened that his wife bore him a son. A Tarsuak came back from his hunting one day and found that he had a son. Then he took that son of his and bore him down to the water and threw him in, and waited until he began to kick out violently, and then took him up again. And so he did with him every day for long after, while the child was growing, and thus the boy became a very clever swimmer. And one day a Tarsuak caught a fjord seal, and took off the skin all in one piece, and dried it like a bladder, and made his son put it on when he went swimming. One day he felt a wish to see how clever the boy had become, and said to him, therefore, Go out now and swim, and I will follow after you. And the father brought down his kayak, and set it in the water, and his son watched him. And then he said, Now, you swim out. And he made his father follow him out to sea, while he swam more and more under water. As soon as he came to the surface, his father rode to where he was, but every time he took his throwing stick to cast a small harpoon, he disappeared. And when his father thought they had done this long enough, he said, Now, swim back to land, but keep under water as much as you can. The sun dived down, but it was a long time before he came up again. And now his father was greatly afraid. But at last the boy came up a long way off, and then he rode up to where he was and laid one hand on his head and said, clever diver clever diver dear little clever one and then he sniffed and a second time he said to him now swim under water a very long way this time so he dived down and his father rode forward all the time to come to the place where he should rise and feeling already afraid his face moved as if he were beginning to cry and he said if only the sharks have not found him and he had just begun to cry when his son came up again and then they went in to land and the boy did not dive any more that day. So clever had he now become. And one day his father did not come back from his hunting. This was because of his enemies who had killed him. Evening came, and next morning there was a kayak from the north. When it came in to the shore, the boy went down and said, Tomorrow the many brothers will come to kill you all. And the kayak turned at once, and went back without coming on shore. Night passed, and morning came, and in the morning when the boy awoke he went to look out and again and many times once when he came out he saw many kayaks appearing from the northward then he went in and said to his mother now many kayaks are coming to kill us all then put on your swimming dress said his mother and he did so and went down to the shore and did not stop until he was quite close to the water when the kayaks then saw him they all rowed towards him and said he has fallen into the water when they came to the place where he had fallen in, they all began looking about for him, and while they were doing this he came up just in front of the bone shoeing on the nose of one of the kayaks, which lay quite away from the rest. When they spied him, each tried to outdo the others and cried, Here he is! But then he dived down again. And this he continued to do. And in this manner he led all those kayaks out to the open sea, and when they had come a great way out, they sighted an iceberg which had run aground. When Atarsuak's son came to this, he climbed up by sticking his hands into the ice, and up above were two large pieces, and when he came close to the iceberg, he heard those in the kayaks saying among themselves, We can cut steps in the ice and climb up to him. And they began cutting steps in the iceberg, and at last the ice pick of the foremost came up over the edge. But now the boy took one of the great pieces of ice and threw it down upon them as they crawled up, so that it sent them all down again as it fell. And again he heard them say, It would be very foolish not to kill him. Let us climb up and try to reach him this time. And then they began crawling up one after another, but now the boy began as before, shifting the great piece of ice. And he waited until the head of the foremost one came up, and then he let it fall and this time he also killed all those who had climbed onto the iceberg, after he had so lured them on to follow him. But the others now turned back and said, He will kill us all if we do not go. 
and now the boy jumped down from the iceberg and swam to the kayaks and began tugging at their paddles so that they turned over but the men righted themselves again with their throwing sticks and at last he was forced to hold them down himself under water till they drowned and soon there were left no more of all those many kayaks save only one and when he looked closer he saw that the man had no weapon but a stick for killing fish and he rowed weeping in towards land that man with no weapon but a stick then the boy pulled the paddle away from him and he cried very much at that then he began paddling with his hands but the boy gripped his hands from below and then the man began crying furiously and dared no longer put his hands in the water at all and weeping very greatly he said it is ill for me that ever i came out on this errand for it is plain that i am to be killed the boy looked at him a little and then said you i will not kill you may go home again and he gave him back his paddle and said to him as he was rowing away tell those of your place never to come out again thinking to kill us for if they do, not one of them will return alive. Then Atarsuak's son went home, and for some time he waited, thinking that more enemies might come, but none ever came against them after that time. Tale 48. Puagsuak There was once a wifeless man who always went out hunting ptarmigan. It became his custom always to go out hunting ptarmigan every day and when he was out one day hunting ptarmigan as was his custom he came to a place whence he could see out over a rocky valley and it looked a good place to go and he went there but before he had come to the bottom of the valley he caught sight of something that looked like a stone and when he could see quite clearly that it was not a stone at all he went up to it he walked and walked and came to it at last then he looked in and saw an old couple sitting alone in there and when he had seen this he crawled very silently in through the passageway and having come inside he looked first a long time at them and then he gave a little whistle but nothing happened when he did so and therefore he whistled a second time and this time they heard the whistle and the man nudged his wife and said you puagswak you can talk with the spirits take counsel with them now when he had said this the wifeless man whistled again and at this whistling the man looked at his wife again and said earnestly listen it sounds as if that might be the voice of a shore dweller one who catches miserable fish and now the wifeless man saw that the old one's wife was letting down her hair and this was because she was now about to ask counsel of the spirits and he was now about to look at them again when he saw that the passageway about him was beginning to close up and it was already nearly closed up but then it opened again of itself then the wifeless man thought only of coming out again from that place and when the passageway again opened he slipped out and then he began running as fast as he could for a long time he ran on with the thought that someone would surely come after him but at last he came up the hillside without having been pursued at all and when he came home he told what had happened here ends this story Tungujuluk and saunikok tungujuluk and saunikok were men from one village and both were wizards when they heard a spirit calling one would change into a bear and the other into a walrus tungujuluk had a son but saunikok had no children as soon as his son was old enough tungujuluk taught him to paddle a kayak at this the other saunikok grew jealous and began planning evil one morning when he awoke he went out hunting seal as usual he had been out some time when he went up to an island and called for his bearskin when it came he got into it and moved off towards tungujuluk's house he landed a little way off and then stole up to kill tungujuluk's son and when he came near he saw him playing with the other children but he did not know that his father had already come home and was sitting busily at work on the kayak he was making for his son he was just about to go up to them when the boy went weeping home to his father and when his father looked round there was a big bear already close to them he took a knife and ran towards it and was just about to stab that bear when it began to laugh and then suddenly tungujuluk remembered that his neighbour saunikok was able to take the shape of a bear and he was now so angry that he had nearly stabbed him in spite of all and it was a hard matter for him to hold back his knife but he did not forget that happening 
he waited until a long time had passed and at last many days later when he awoke in the morning he went out in his kayak on the way he came to an island and going up on to that island he called his other shape to him when it came he crawled into it and became a walrus and when he had thus become a walrus he went to that place where it was the custom for kayaks to hunt seal and when he came near he looked round and sighted saunikok who lay there waiting for seal now he rose to the surface quite near him and when saunikok saw him he came over that way and saunikok lifted his harpoon to throw it and the stroke could not fail therefore he made himself small and crept over to one side of the skin and when he was struck he floundered about a little but not too violently lest he should break the line then he swam away under water with the bladder float and folded it up under his arm and took out the air from it and swam in towards land and swam and swam until he came to the land near by where his kayak was lying then he went to it and having taken out the point of the harpoon he went out hunting he struck a black seal and rowed home at once and when he had come home he said to his wife make haste and cook the breast piece and when that breast piece was cooked and the other kayaks had come home he made a meat feast and saunikok thinking nothing of any matter came in with the others when he came in tungujuluk made no sign of knowing anything but went and took out the bladder and line from his kayak and then all sat down to eat together and they ate and were satisfied and then each man began telling of his day's hunting at last saunikok said to-day when i struck a walrus i did not think at all that it should cause me to lose my bladder float where that came up again is a thing we do not know that bladder float of mine was lost and when saunikok had said this tungujuluk took that bladder and line and laid them beside the meat dish and said whose can this bladder be now i wonder aha at last i have paid you for the time when you came in the shape of a bear and mocked us and when these words were said the many who sat there laughed greatly but saunikok got up and went away and then next morning very early he set out and rowed northward in his umiak and since then he has not been seen so great a shame did he feel tale fifty anartek there was once an old man and he had only one son and that son was called anartek but he had many daughters they were very fond of going out reindeer hunting to the eastward of their own place in a fjord and when they came right into the base of the fjord anartek would let his sisters go up the hillside to drive the reindeer and when they drove them so those beasts came out into a big lake where anartek could row out in his kayak and kill them all thus in a few days they had their umiak filled with meat and could go home again one day when they were out reindeer hunting as was their custom and the reindeer had swum out and anartek was striking them down he saw a calf and he caught hold of it by the tail and began to play with it but suddenly the reindeer heaved up its body above the surface of the water and kicked at the kayak so that it turned over he tried to get up but could not because the kayak was full of water and at last he crawled out of it the women looked at him from the shore but they could not get out to help him and at last they heard him say now the salmon are beginning to eat my belly and very slowly he went to the bottom now when anartek woke again to his senses he had become a salmon but his father was obliged to go back alone and from that time having no son he must go out hunting as if he had been a young man he never again rode up to those reindeer grounds where they had hunted before and now that anartek had thus become a salmon he went with the others in the spring when the rivers break up out into the sea to grow fat but his father greatly wishing to go once more to their old hunting grounds went there again as chief of a party after many years had passed his daughters rode for him and when they came in near to the base of the fjord he thought of his son and began to weep but his son coming up from the sea with the other salmon saw the umiak and his father in it weeping then he swam to it and caught hold of the paddle with which his father steered his father was greatly frightened at this and drew his paddle out of the water and said anartek had nearly pulled the paddle from my hand that time and for a long while he did not venture to put his paddle in the water again when he did so at last he saw that all his daughters were weeping and a second time 
Anartek swam quickly up to the umiak. Again the father tried to draw in his paddle when the son took hold of it, but this time he could not move it. But then at last he drew it quite slowly to the surface, in such a way that he drew his son up with it. And then Anartek became a man again, and hunted for many years to feed his kin. Tale 51 The Guillemot That Could Talk A man from the south heard one day of a Guillemot that could talk. It was said that this bird was to be found somewhere in the north, and therefore he set off to the northward, and toiled along north and north in an umiak. He came to a village and said to the people there, I am looking for a guillemot that can talk. Three days' journey away you will find it. Then he stayed there only that night, and went on again next morning. And when he came to a village he had just asked his way, when one of the men there said, Tomorrow I will go with you, and I will be a guide for you, because I know the way. Next morning when they awoke, those two men set off together. They rode and rode, and came in sight of a bird cliff. They came to the foot of that bird cliff, and when they stood at the foot and looked up, it was a mightily big bird cliff. Now where is that Guillema, I wonder, said the man from the south. He had hardly spoken, when the man who was his guide said, Here, here is the nest of that Guillema bird. And the man was prepared to be very careful when the bird came out of its nest. And it came out, that bird, and went to the side of the cliff, and stared down at the kayaks, stretching its body to make it very long. And sitting up there, it said quite clearly, This, I think, must be that southern man who has come far from a place in the south to hear a guillemot. And the bird had hardly spoken, when he who was guide saw that the man from the south had fallen forward on his face. And when he lifted him up, that man was dead, having died of fright at hearing the bird speak. Then, seeing there was no other thing to be done, he covered up the body at the foot of the cliff below the guillemot's nest, and went home, and told the others of his place that he had covered him there, below the guillemot's nest, because he was dead. And the umiak and its crew of women stayed there, and wintered in that place. Next summer, when they were making ready to go southward again, they had no man to go with them. But on the way, that wifeless man procured food for them by catching fish and when he had caught enough to fill a pot, he rode in with his catch. And in this way he led them southward. When they came to their own country, they had grown so fond of him that they would not let him go northward again. And so that wifeless man took a wife from among those women, because they would not let him go away to the north. It is said that the skeleton of that wifeless man lies there in the south to this day. Tale 52 Kanagsuak. Kanagsuak, men say, went out from his own place to live on a little island, and there took to wife the only sister of many brothers. And while he lived there with her, it happened once that the cold became so great that the sea between the islands was ice-bound and they could no longer go out hunting. At last they had used up their store of food, and when that store of food was used up and none of them could go out hunting, they all remained lying down from hunger and weakness. Once, when there was open water to the south, where they often caught seal, Kanagsuak took his kayak on his head and went out hunting. He rode out in a northerly wind, with snow falling and a heavy sea, and soon he came upon a number of black seal. He rode towards them, to get within striking distance, but struck only a little fjord seal, which came up between him and the others. This one was easier to cut up, he said. Now when he had got this seal, he took his kayak on his head again and went home across the ice, and his house-fellows shouted for joy when they saw the little creature he sent sliding in. Next day he went out again and caught two black seal, and after that he never went out without bringing home something. The north wind continued, and the snow and the cold continued. When he lay out waiting for seal, as was now his custom, he often wished that he might meet with Kiliterak, the great hunter from another place, who was the only one who would venture out in such weather. But this did not come about. Now there was a great dearth of food also in the place where Kiliterak lived, and therefore Kiliterak took his kayak on his head and went out across the ice to hunt seal. And coming some way, he sighted Kanagsuak, who had already made his catch, and was just getting his tow-line out. As soon as he came up, Kanagsuak cut away the whole of the belly-skin and gave it to him. 
and Killy Terrock felt now a great desire for blubber, and took some good big pieces to chew. And while he lay there, some black seal came up, and Kanagsawak said, Row in to where they are. And he rowed into them and harpooned one, and killed it on the spot with that one stroke. He took his bladder float to make a tow line fast, and wound up the harpoon line, but before he had come to the middle, a breaking wave came rolling down on him and it broke over him and it seemed indeed as if there were no kayak there at all so utterly was it hidden by that breaking wave then at last the bladder showed up behind the kayak and a little after the kayak itself came up with the paddles held in a balancing position now for the second time he took his bladder in line and just as he came to the place where the tow line is made fast there came another wave and washed over him so that he disappeared and then he came up a second time and as he came up he said i am now so far out that i cannot make my tow-line fast will you do this for me and then kanagsuak made his tow-line fast and as soon as he had taken the seal in tow he rowed away in the thickly falling snow and was soon lost to sight when he came home his many comrades in the village were filled with great thankfulness towards him and thereafter it was as before that he never came home without some catch a few days later they awoke and saw that the snow was not falling near them now but only far away on the horizon and after that the weather became fine again and when the spring came they began hunting guillemots driving them together in flocks and killing them so this they did at that time and now one day they had sent their bird arrows showering down among the birds and were busy placing the killed ones together in the kayaks and then suddenly a kayak came in sight on the sunny side and when that stranger came nearer they looked eagerly to see who it might be and when kili terok came nearer for it was kili terok who came he looked round among the kayaks and when he saw that kanagsuak was among them he thrust his way through and came close up to him and stuck his paddle in between the thongs on kanagsuak's kayak and then loosened the skin over the opening of his own kayak and put his hand in behind and drew out a splendid tow-line made of walrus hide and beautifully worked with many beads of walrus tooth and a second time he put in his hand and took out now a piece of bearskin fashioned to the seat of a kayak and these things he gave to kanagsuak and said once in the spring when i could not make my tow-line fast to a seal you helped me and made it fast here is that which shall thank you for that service and then he rode away End of section 12, tales 47 to 52. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. End of Eskimo Folk Tales by Knut Rasmussen. Translated by W. W. Worcester.